all across India, people cope with the scorching summer, waiting with bated breath for the first rain, for the start of the monsoon. It's a phenomenon that affects the entire country in profound ways. Two-thirds of our nation is dependent on agriculture. And so, the monsoon becomes vital to our economy, to our survival. But the monsoon has a huge scope for disaster also. Too much rain and the country is flooded. Too little rain leads to drought and farmer suicides. In this episode, we track the monsoon, the science of how it works, how we can predict its vagaries and how any variation in this can lead to a disaster. Now, is the monsoon a purely Indian phenomenon? South Asia, right from uh, East Africa, East Africa to uh, Japan, uh, across Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia and China, everybody experiences monsoon. It is a within the large scale embedded circulation, there are separate segments of monsoon. So, Indian monsoon is one of the perhaps uh, most stronger and spectacular one as compared to other segment of the monsoon. Before seeing how the monsoon hits India, let us explore the scientific genesis of the monsoon. In its simplest form, monsoons are massive, seasonally changing sea breeze circulations that form due to temperature differences between land and ocean. The word monsoon comes from the word mausam, which means season. And so the distinguishing attribute of the monsoon is large seasonal variation in wind and rain. We know that land masses heat up more quickly than the ocean. This makes the air above the land heat and rise, producing an area of low pressure. The air over the cooler ocean waters is under higher pressure, so air moves from high pressure to low pressure. This moist air forms rain clouds. The rising air over the land is drawn over the oceans to replace the sinking oceanic air, thus completing the cycle. Now let's move this from theory into practice. Monsoons occur in the tropical and subtropical regions on either side of the equator. The trade winds meet in this region, creating a small band of low pressure around the equator known as the Intertropical Convergence Zone. Monsoon, in fact, is a manifestation of the seasonal variation of this ITCG. So, it comes to visit us every summer from the southern hemispheric uh, equatorial Indian Ocean where it is in the winter. What exactly happens here? In the summer, a high pressure area lies over the Indian Ocean while a low pressure exists over the Asian continent. So air masses will move from the high pressure over the ocean to the low over the continent, bringing moisture laden air to South Asia. During Southeast monsoon, the wind blows across the equator from the southern hemisphere towards the northern hemisphere. As it crosses the equator, it changes its directions because of the rotation of the earth and winds are southwesterly over Arabian Sea and the adjoining peninsular India and hence the name, the Southeast Monsoon. And these winds come to India as the monsoon. They arrive around the 1st of June in Kerala, the southern tip of the country. These then bifurcate into two branches the Arabian and the Bay of Bengal branch. The Arabian branch covers the western coast of the country and then heads over Punjab and Himachal. The Bay of Bengal branch touches West Bengal, Meghalaya and then heads west to merge with the Arabian branch. This process continues till the end of September and is known as the Southwest Monsoon. When this monsoon retreats, most of it moves over the land, so there is very little rain. One strand, however, moves over the Bay of Bengal where it picks up a significant amount of moisture which is subsequently released when it moves back over the land. Areas in Tamil Nadu, coastal Andhra and parts of Karnataka get rain from this northeast or winter monsoon. Now the monsoon varies 
and its variations can be disastrous to much of the country. So the prediction of the monsoon is critical so that we can plan for it. To understand how this works, we travel to the India Meteorological Department or the IMD, the country's official weather forecaster to see the mechanisms in place. From its inception, the strength of the IMD has been the collection of data and analyzing it. And this continues to form the backbone of IMD's working. Much of the monsoon prediction comes from studying past data and analyzing trends. Along with this is a huge amount of real-time observations using satellites and radars across the network of on-the-ground observatories that together collate information every moment. First and foremost duty of IMD has been to observe correctly. So therefore over the years we have taken out various programs to enhance and expand our observational uh, capacity say in terms of the surface observations, upper air observations and observations from the space. The IMD has a wide range of state-of-the-art equipment to observe and collect data, which includes balloons, radar and of course a range of satellites. In fact, the IMD was one of the first of the developing countries to have its own network of satellites. INSAT series are launched only for uh, uh, weather forecasting purposes by our Indian Space Research Organization. So we are fortunate uh, to have uh, continuously data of temperature, moisture and winds uh, not only from the land by our observing systems, from oceans also, Bay of Bengal, Arabian Sea, Indian Ocean. So that has enhanced the prediction uh, capabilities and the skill of uh, uh, forecast. Using all this technology, the IMD has been able to make huge improvements in their monsoon prediction, especially in the range and types of forecasts. Other institutes, like the Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology in Pune, have also worked at developing state-of-the-art prediction techniques. They have installed a supercomputer called Pratyush in January 2018 that has the capacity to provide more exact information on extreme weather events on active and break spells of the monsoon and marine water along the coasts. Now let us explore the science behind some of the factors that cause a variation in the Indian monsoon with such disastrous consequences. Like the El Nino. The El Nino is an unusual climate pattern that occurs once every two to seven years in the Pacific Ocean. It causes the waters in the Pacific near the equator to get heated up. This warmer surface water is pushed towards Indonesia by strong surface winds. When this happens, the cooler waters underneath rise up near the oceans of South America. However, sometimes these winds are weaker than usual and sometimes they actually blow the other way towards South America instead of Indonesia. In this case, the warm surface water along the equator piles up along the coast of South America. This is the El Nino. The La Nina is sort of the opposite. During a La Nina, the water in the same area along the equator gets colder than usual. This change in the water temperatures affects fishing, rain and weather patterns not just in the region but around the world. We know that the El Nino is happening when water temperatures go up between 2 and 10 degrees. So when the El Nino happens and the waters get warmer, our monsoon is usually deficient. According to an analysis by IMD, of the 18 El Nino years between 1880 and 2006, 7 have had deficient and 5 below normal rainfall in the country. There are a host of other factors that also cause these variations ranging from the pre-monsoon heating over the country to high pressure over Madagascar. But we're ready for a short break now. When we come back, we explore floods and droughts, often consequences of our monsoon. Keep watching to find out more. In our exploration of the monsoon, 
we are seeing how both a shortfall or an excess can have devastating consequences on the ground. Floods are a common occurrence during the monsoons. In some states like Assam and Bihar, these are almost annual, causing death and destruction in their wake. And in some years, the damage is on an unprecedented scale. Like the rains of Uttarakhand in 2013. The rain led to roads and bridges being washed away. There were huge landslides that wiped out villages, homes and communities. One community was especially affected. Close to 75,000 pilgrims who were on their way to Kedarnath. Weather-wise, if you just look at it, it was the interaction of the mid-latitude westerlies and the monsoon, which was advancing for the region on that particular day, 16 June. And whenever there is interaction of two types of winds, westerlies and easterlies, they lead to intense convective activity and rainfall activity. So there was continuous rainfall over Uttarakhand area. This kind of enormous rainfall can also lead to a glough, which is a glacial lake outburst flood, which can have devastating consequences. This is what happened in Chorobaritaal, a glacial lake right above Kedarnath. The rims of the lake collapsed, leading to a deluge of water overwhelming the area. Gloughs are capable of releasing billions of cubic meters of glacial water in a few short hours or even in a matter of minutes and virtually without warning to those living downstream. All this led to an overwhelming impact on both people and property. Over 10,000 people died and 5,000 people missing. Insurance companies estimated property losses of over 2,500 crore rupees. On a positive note, the disaster mechanism did kick in. The NDRF or the National Disaster Response Force sent 14 teams to the affected areas. Along with the Army, Air Force, civil society organizations and a host of other bodies all worked with the local administration to facilitate rescue operations. It is important to understand that more than the forces of nature, this tragedy was man-made. Unchecked development of cities, dams and roads have made so many areas of our country ecologically fragile. This was the reason behind the 2015 Chennai floods, which submerged the city to such an extent that people were using boats to move around. The rains were super high that year, but experts believe that it was the thoughtless building up of the city that led to the huge damage caused by these rains. In just the last four decades, the urbanization in Chennai has increased by almost 20 times. The city is dotted with wetlands and natural channels where excess water from the city that is essentially a very flat area can be drained off. Just to illustrate the point, the city airport has been built on the flood plains of River Adyar. A sprawling bus terminal in flood-prone Coimbatore, an MRTS constructed almost wholly over the Buckingham Canal, and new industrial areas for automobile and telecom built on important drainage courses and catchments. With all this, this city has lost the natural resilience to battle the monsoon. So these floods in 2015 were completely avoidable and actually are because of irresponsible urban planning. And this is true of much of the flooding in recent years. Kerala, Kashmir, Mumbai, the list goes on. Now let's look at the other side of the issue, droughts, which is what happens when there is a deficiency in the amount of rain over an extended period of time, like an entire season. It is considered a drought season occurs when there is less than 75% of average rainfall for consecutive periods. And now this lack of rain, if severe enough, can affect surface and groundwater. And it affects the vegetation, crops, animals and farmers. In some areas of India, 
like the Maratwada region of Maharashtra, shortage of rainfall is quite common. On an average, this area receives 30% less rain than the rest of the country. It isn't as if you get drought every year in Maratwada. Maratwada doesn't get too much rain and it varies a great deal. So this has to be taken into account in our planning for the water resources in Maratwada. According to a study by the Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology and the Indian Institute of Science, between 1870 and 2015, the region faced 22 droughts. Now, the rest of Maharashtra receives heavy rain. So what happens here? This region is under the influence of southwest monsoon. When the rains hit this coast, massive rainfall occurs over the coastal regions then the western ghats prevent the monsoon from moving inwards. And so, rainfall decreases from west to east. By the time it reaches the Maratwada region, the average rainfall becomes 750 mm. After the rainfall taken, takes place over the ghats and to the uh, top of the ghats and to the lee side, windward side of the ghats, on the lee side, uh, clouds take some time to recharge the moisture and then start precipitating again. So, this um, coastal uh, Konkan and Goa, coastal part of the Konkan coast, they get heavy rainfall. Immediately, Madhya Maharashtra and Maratwada, it takes time. Now, the person most affected by these kind of variations in the monsoon, like a drought, is the farmer. We will see ways in which science can help right after the break. In a country where agriculture is the mainstay of over 60% of the population, variations in the monsoon of any weather phenomena have a huge impact on the farmer. But there are a number of ways in which the farmer can cope with these vagaries. Soil and water conservation is a big step. Ponds, tanks and trenches are thus a big part of the adaptation program. Many of these are traditional in India and need to be revived if needed. Smart irrigation systems such as drip and sprinklers make a huge difference in water management. Today there are apps like Kisan Suvidha, Bhuvan and Ifko Kisan that feed the farmers a host of information. These include real-time updates on weather that help the farmer take steps that could protect his crop and his livelihood. The other change that can be effective is a switch to different crops. Rice and wheat sell for high prices but consume a lot of water, another reason for groundwater depletion. Farmers are now encouraged to plant a variety of crops including a millet variety that are developed for shorter growing seasons. There are also a whole variety of crops that have been developed to cope with droughts and floods. We travel to the National Institute of Plant Genome Research in New Delhi to meet with Dr. Debashish Chattopadhyay, who has been working on a variety of chickpea and tomato to make them drought resistant. If you want to know a plant, then you should know the genes of the plant. So that's why we study genes or DNA of the plant. And uh, we do some fundamental research that how plant grows, how plant flowers, how root development uh, works and how leaf and flower development works. So we do some fundamental research work and with that also we some of our research finding we translate so that it can go to field uh, to go to the farmers or go to the society. What the scientists here have developed is a way of increasing the length of the root of the plant which can then travel deep into the ground to extract residual moisture. How did he do this? Very simply, he isolated the gene responsible for long root growth. They then inserted this into the genome of the chickpea to develop a new variety. In this way, the new variety has developed roots which can go deeper into the soil. And this helps it cope in drought situations and also gives a better yield. My laboratory do the genome sequencing, then mapping of the genes, crossing the different chickpea varieties and to find out a 
good variety for uh, for the growth high yield these kind of changes have been worked into all kinds of plants and could alter the way in which farmers are coping with the vagaries of the rain now there are more drastic measures that science offers when there is shortage of rain like cloud seeding The Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology in Pune has scientists who are working on research that could make cloud seeding a viable option. We are hiring aircraft and we are indeed going with the aircraft to the cloud base and we have a setup called it is called a flare. This flare is a compressed material which while burned it will release the aerosol particles needed for the seeding. The idea here is to disperse substances like silver iodide aerosols or dry ice into the cloud. These chemicals introduce nucleation, which basically means that the water in the air condenses around these particles, and this in turn induces precipitation. Experts here have studied the clouds in order to understand a host of criteria like liquid water content in preparation for the actual seeding process. the research aircraft which is equipped with much many more instrumentation which will go at, at different levels in the cloud and look at it, how it is growing whether the precipitation particles are present we have also probes on the aircraft that can measure the precipitation particles and then the radar at the ground will be monitoring the surface how much is received at the surface rain is formed in the cloud but it has to reach the surface in order to have efficacy of the seeding and so we've traveled through the science of the monsoon and studied its uncertainties through all this what emerged is that she is life giving and life sustaining all we need to learn is how to manage our land earth and water resources so we can understand and plan a little better for her vagaries <laughs>